Okay, this is a question about eccentric loading. And by eccentric loading, we mean a load where it's different to an axial load. So it's off the center of something. And the main thing to remember, the kind of key principle of all of this, is that you can substitute in this eccentric load. We can change to an axial load and a bending moment, and that will have exactly the same effect on the column. And obviously, we've already covered in other parts of the module how to analyze the axial load and how to analyze the effect of the bending moment. The axial load just has the same magnitude, so if this was f, that's f, and the bending moment is a force times a distance, so it's the force times the eccentricity. Um, it, the question I'm actually looking at here is this one um, about a short hollow cylindrical column. Sorry, that's not very well focused. I'll see if I can improve it. That's maybe a bit better. Um, a short hollow cylindrical column with a compressive load of 400 kilonewtons, uh, an outside diameter of 200 millimeters, and an inside diameter of 150 millimeters. So I've drawn out the column, and then we can also say the compressive load equals uh, 400,000 newtons. Um, and it's a question asking us to find the maximum possible eccentricity. So we don't know this value E, and we have to uh, calculate it. Um, it's just worth writing down pretty quickly that we're going to end up using the bending equation here, um, m over i equals sigma over y. Um, and we're also going to be interested in axial stresses, so that is sigma call it sigma sub b for bending, and then sigma a for sigma due to the axial load equals force over area. So before I start anything else, there are two geometric terms there that I need to think about. First of all, there's i, the second moment of area, and then there's the area itself. Uh, so let's just calculate those. Uh, we can say a, the area, is pi uh, r outer squared minus pi r inner squared. It's the area of this big outer circle minus the area of this smaller inner circle. Remember these are diameters so I'll need to half them to get uh, radii. So that's going to be pi times 0 0.1 squared minus pi times 0 0.075 squared Uh, and that comes out to be 0 0.0137 square meters. Um, and then to calculate i, uh, we need i for a circle. Second moment of area of a circle is um, pi d to the 4 on 64, I think. I'm just going to um, pause this while I go. Uh, okay, I uh, f found that, um, and this is what we're looking at, and I was right, that the second moment of area for a circular cross-section is pi d to the 4 on 64. So that's good to know, and because we've got, um, again, an inside diameter and an outside diameter, we have to take the difference between them. So it's going to be pi um, capital D to the 4, or outside diameter to the 4 on 64, minus pi small d to the 4 on 64, which equals pi times 0 0.2 to the 4 on 64, minus pi times 0 0.15 to the 4 on 64, which equals... Um, I'm getting 5.369 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so that's our geometric work done. We've got the information that we're going to need in terms of the geometry. Um, so now what I'm going to do is calculate the axial stress, and then I'll calculate the bending stress. So the axial stress is fairly easy to calculate. It's force over area. We've got the force. 
and we know the area is this number, so that's 0 0.0137. And that turns out to be 29.2 uh, megapascals. And that's compression, because we were told that the uh, force acting on the column is compressive. So um, that's fine. Uh, I think I'll take a new piece of paper, a new page, to uh, have a look at the bending stress. So we wrote down m over i equals sigma over y. That's the bending equation from the data sheet. And I said that's um, sigma b, the bending stress. As always, the maximum stress comes at the uh, maximum distance from the axis. And so I'm going to say um, sigma b max equals m times y max divided by i. Um, and we know the numbers for that. Um, just going back, what we need actually is the moment, and we know that the bending moment is the force times the eccentricity. So I'm going to write down that the bending moment is 400,000 times e from bending moment equals force times eccentricity multiplied by uh, y max so um, it's important not to get confused here there are two distances from the central axis that we're interested in the first is e the eccentricity which is where the force is located but the maximum it doesn't matter where the force is located the maximum bending moments are always going to be at the edge of the column um, because that's how bending works. There's some uh, neutral axis somewhere in all bending problems, and then there's a maximum tension the furthest you can get from that neutral axis in one direction, and a maximum compression the furthest you can get from the neutral axis in another direction. So the important thing here is that the maximum bending moment is going to occur at a distance of 0 .0, uh, 100 millimeters from the center, or 0 0.1 meters. And we calculated I, and it equals 5.369 times 10 to the minus 5. Um, and when I put all of that together, that is um, uh, 745 times 10 to the minus 6, sorry, times 10 to the plus 6, multiplied by e, uh, where e is this eccentricity, the distance from the central axis. Um, OK, so we've got two different stresses. We've got a, a bending stress, sorry, an axial stress of 29.2 megapascals and a bending stress which depends on um, the uh, eccentricity e. I guess I could actually write this since we've got the other answer in megapascals. I'm going to write that that is 745 times e and that's a value in megapascals. Um, the axial stress is always compressive. The bending stress has a maximum compressive value on one side and a maximum um, a tensile value on the other side. So the maximum compression is going to be uh, the axial stress plus the maximum bending stress. And that happens basically here on this side of the column, or here, uh, where we've got compression due to the axial load and we've also got compression due to the bending moment. Um, and so that's going to be uh, 29.2 plus 745e megapascals. Uh, and we're told in the question that must be less than uh, 75 megapascals. That's part of the question. Um, so we can say, OK, that means 745e must be less than 75 minus 29.2. 45.8 and that means that E must be less than 
0.0615 meters or I guess that's uh, 61 millimeters and then we also have to think about the problem in tension the maximum tension this time um, the axial compression is subtracted from our tensile uh, force so now we're looking at what's happening on this side of the column because that's going to be in tension so the bending moment is causing tension over here but the axial load is still causing compression so it's going to be a sigma b max minus sigma a which equals 745e minus 29.2 and we're told that that must be uh, less than 15 megapascals which means that 745e has to be less than 44.2 which means that e must be less than 0.0593 meters um, sorry I'll move that up so it's in shot uh, so what we've got there is um, we started to get the understanding and we know we'll break the condition on tension our tension will be uh, too high if the eccentricity is greater than this value and the compression will be too high if the eccentricity is greater than that value so the more limiting one is that one there so that means that the maximum value of E equals uh, 59.3 millimeters and that's our answer um, and I'm just going to continue and then I'll come back and look at what we've done overall but the final part of the question says draw a diagram for this eccentricity showing the distribution of stress across a section of the column uh, so the diagram will look something like this uh, that's stress and this is X the distance across the column so the column itself is 0 0.2 meters wide we'll say the stress is in megapascals um, and we know in the middle of the column it's neither in tension or oh sorry the bending moment is zero so the only stress is the axial stress which we know is 29.2 so I can mark that on there 29.2 um, at the left hand side of the column um, we know that we were just at the condition where the tensile stress in the column was going to be uh, 15 megapascals and we agreed that that's on the left hand side of the column uh, so this is compression uh, positive on the graph and tension negative on the graph you can do this the other way around if you like but that works fine and this is then 15 megapascals tension on the left hand side of the column and I guess we can say uh, stress on the right hand side now equals m y over i equals uh, the moment is the force times the eccentricity that's uh, 400,000 times 0 0.0593 multiplied by the maximum distance which is 0 0.1 meters that's to the edge of the column that's basically uh, so that number there is 0 0.1 that's this 0 0.1 meters here that we're talking about and we know I is uh, 5.369 times 10 to the minus 5 and that comes out to be uh, 44.2 uh, megapascals and that's the I suppose I should have said Sigma B on the right hand side that's the bending stress on the right hand side so the total stress on the right hand side equals Sigma a that's a compression uh, sorry, uh, compression 
total stress on the right hand side equals sigma A plus sigma B right hand side uh, which equals um, 29.2 plus 44.2 which equals 73.4 73.4 megapascals and that's this point here um, and everything goes in a straight line the stress across an eccentrically loaded column is always a straight line and so if you wanted you could even go so far as to calculate this point here and that would tell you where the stress in the column was zero but in any case, this graph is now the answer to the final part of the question. This is a diagram showing the distribution of stress across a section of the column. So just to finish up on that, the really important thing is actually this diagram that we started with right at the beginning, uh, which says we can replace the eccentric load with an axial load and a bending moment. Um, then we have to do two sets of calculations. One is about the axial load and the stress due to the axial load. The other is about the stress due to the bending moment. The stress due to the axial load is constant across the column and um, I guess it might be useful if we just do two other graphs here. Uh, if I just show you where this comes from. If we say this is sigma axial, then that is constant across the column, uh, like so. And that has a value of 29.2. And if we look at the bending stress, Uh, the bending stress goes exactly like this uh, so that the, um, the bending stress in the middle of the column is zero, the neutral axis of the column is in the middle, and the bending stress in compression here on the left hand side is the same as the bending, uh, sorry, on compression on the right hand side, is the same as the bending stress in tension on the left hand side. So this graph here is like this graph plus this graph and I guess that number there is 44.2 and this number is minus 44.2 um, and that's how we um, that's another way of looking at this graph here that I've drawn so the whole problem comes back to thinking of the eccentric load as being the sum of the effect of the axial load and the bending moment uh, and that's how you deal with eccentric loads. Um, you might get a question with a square column or different shapes, um, but it's always the same set of principles and you're always going to break it up into treating it as an axial load and treating it as a bending moment.